quite the site, so there's a heck of a lot that has to be done with the information. And I'm going to give you just a very brief uh, background to it because what I really want to talk about, of course, is public engagement. Um, we are only in our first fully funded year of a project where we were trying to digitize everything from Ur. And so our public engagement isn't huge yet, so I want to really just show some questions and the bit that we have done as a sort of experiment. So um, this, of course, is an aerial shot. I believe it's from 1931. And you can see just how much Sir Leonard Woolley excavated at this site. Uh, there are massive uh, dump areas. You know, that's all his back dirt uh, in these, these long trails. So the ziggurat is here. The ziggurat, of course, is huge. And he dug out all of these areas. And we can see just how much work he did. Now, he did publish it well for his day. There are about 10 volumes in the series. But he didn't publish everything, and there's a heck of a lot of more questions that can be done, so or can be investigated if that data uh, gets out to people. So briefly, it was excavated for 12 years. Uh, it was sponsored jointly by the University of Pennsylvania Museum and uh, the British Museum. And um, at the time, the laws had excavation materials divided, so half of it remained in Iraq with the newly formed Iraq Museum. The whole country of Iraq was being formed at this time, of course. And uh, the other half was split between Philadelphia and London. So already the artifacts were split up. And even one context, for instance, a tomb, sometimes objects from that same tomb are split around the world. And if we can investigate them together, of course, as archaeologists, we want to reconstruct context wherever we can. Uh, this, the, that's true for archival material as well. The letters that came from the excavation are in archives in London and in Philadelphia and in Baghdad. And when we really look at all of these artifacts, we find out that about 40% of them have lost their connection to their field data. And that field data is really the core. It's the information that Woolley himself gathered. And yes, he tried to cover it in his publications, but all of it uh, is not there. And it needs to be accessible, those primary records. So that's our real goal, is to digitally reunite everything for more. So if we can reinvestigate every object, photograph it, put it out there, uh, connect it to any of the notes that were there, uh, and to any of the field photographs, to the modern photographs, everything we've got. And we want it available for everyone. And so our audience is huge. And that's one of the big things that I'm going to try to uh, address here, because obviously we have talked about identifying an audience. We want to share all of that data in a linked way with anything else that can connect. And of course, further the understanding of archaeology and of the site of ore and Near East in general. So. One of our biggest questions right now, even at the end of this first year, which has been exploratory, is what do we call ourselves? Uh, or project is boring, you know? And if we're talking about engagement, well, what do we need? Something really flashy and fancy? Again, I think it depends on, on audience. Um, we've called it the digitization project, that too. Pretty boring. Um, at, at the British Museum, they've been talking about the concordance. OK, concordance. It's an interesting word, but a lot of the lay public just say, well, well what, do you, what do you mean? Uh, but I wanted to show you that we are thinking about all these audiences, and how do we reach them all? At, at, well, I'm only putting the top of the pyramid here because it's a, it's a very small group of people that are hardcore interested in that very minute data. But we want to be able to have that out there, of course. Uh, they're very specialized, and maybe they just want the data. They don't need the big flashy interface, but they need to get it. In between, I've got this very broad sort of education anywhere from primary schools on up. If they want to learn about the Near East, we do want to provide material for them. They might need a different interface. And the general public, uh, maybe they're just interested. Hopefully, tourism in Iraq will increase. Maybe they will want to just visit the site of war when that becomes more possible. Um, and we want to provide all that information. Does it mean we need three different user interfaces? I'm not sure yet. We haven't built the website. We're just looking at how this is going to work. We're still in data gathering phase and still talking about all of those. So uh, maybe if anyone has ideas, they can discuss it with me. We also have not agreed on logos. This is not. This is just to sort of throw it together. Maybe you can make it a little more exciting. But then it looks busy. And it, what does it really mean? And we can't call it the digitization project, can we? Or what about something like virtual? Or maybe this jumps out at us. Uh, it implies that we're going to have these fly-throughs. We don't have them. Maybe, eventually, we can reconstruct the whole site in 3D. It's going to take a long time. Uh, and we want not to wait forever and then drop it. We want to do it in iterations and, and find out what works. Get it out there as quickly as possible. Other suggestions have been you know, engaged by saying we're, we're reliving this, or we're resurrecting it, or we're rebuilding. All of them have their own connotations, and we still just don't really know uh, what we're going to call it. 
Very quickly, I'll show you the kinds of data that we have, though, that we are already putting uh, digital. There are 73 volumes like this in the British Museum. They contain Sir Leonard Woolley's original catalog cards and his field notes. They've all been scanned, but I'm afraid there's not the greatest quality yet. We did it a long time ago with, with no money, so we did it on low resolution. We're going to have to probably do them again. But you can see that he even has drawings in there. Those aren't published, but online we could get hold of that, and we can, we can show it to people. Uh, anyone could look at that material. So we've been entering all of these. We now have all of well, these catalog cards, 53 of those volumes, are now into a joint database that will form the core of our eventual uh, online presence. So all of this information then goes into something like that. It's just sort of our workstation there. We've hired people to do this, both at Penn and at the British Museum. These are the cards right across the street at the British Museum, just in uh, cabinets like this, which has additional information on every artifact. We're trying to combine them all. Archivally, we have a lot of material, and some of it is absolutely fascinating, not just for archaeologists, but for historians of the period of the 1920s, perhaps. This is our permit to excavate, and you'll see, of course, that it's permit number one issued by the government of Iraq, because they had only just become uh, a nation. And it's signed, of course, by Gertrude Bell, uh, who was the honorary uh, director of antiquities at the time, and Leonard Woolley. So we've got a lot of things like this. Um, we could call up information on people of interest, not just artifacts or, or the ancient world. We can look at the more, more recent stuff. So for instance, this particular letter from 1921 when they were discussing the excavations mentions people like T.E. Lawrence and uh, Winston Churchill. It um, really it mentions the Cairo Conference there, which of course is, is creating uh, Iraq. Well. I know I'm going off the quote here, but I'm trying to get us to tea. So the, <laughs> one of the things that we've done in order to try and engage people, even at this early stage in the data gathering, is to try to crowdsource some of those letters and the field notes, help get people to help us make that digitally searchable. I, of course, have people who are scanning the, the documents for me, but it takes a lot of time just to type them in to make them actually work. So I have created a site, and I only went live with it maybe six, seven weeks ago, uh, in the middle of September. And I put up 450 pages just to see if this could potentially work. And now I have 79 volunteers, and I've got 384 pages transcribed, which is, OK, maybe it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but it does show that it can work. I have a few very interested people who have done most of that work. And the rest of them just sort of come in and look at it. But, and that's fine. That's what crowdsourcing can do if they get interested. Um, you keep them engaged, and I am finding that that's difficult for me because right now I'm the one who goes in there and tries to uh, quality control it and make sure that the people who are participating feel like they're making a difference. And I think someone had presented that in one of these presentations earlier today. It's true. You really do still need to stay in touch and, and show them how that's being used. And right now, since it's not going, it, well, there isn't a bigger presence in the website. It's just this. It's kind of up to me to try and keep them involved in understanding that, yes, they are helping. Now, um, I don't know if I can go live to it, so I went ahead and took a couple of screenshots of what this site looks like. It's orcrowdsource.org, and anyone can go there and look at any of the material that I've put up so far, uh, you know, just over 1,200 pages at the moment. And uh, this is just a, a brief portion of it. They're, they're separated into collections, so that first are the letters from the very early periods, and then we've got uh, Max Malawan's field notes, and then I've got several of so many Woolies as well. Uh, I haven't put them all yet because we're just sort of working with what we've got to see how this is going to work. Once you have found a particular object, oh, that was, I'll get back to the why I wanted to talk about audience again here in a second. But once you have got a particular uh, field note card, for instance, this one um, is, I've zoomed in on it. So you can zoom in, you can move around, you can try to look at the handwriting more closely. And then, of course, you can type in what it actually says. And of course, with handwritten notes, we can't use the optical character recognition. We can do it on the typewritten one, but I've got a lot of typewritten stuff in there, too. Um, and I do find that most people right now are doing the letters because those are easier. Uh, so with the field notes, there can be some strange words in there that maybe they're not recognizing. But it is starting to work, I think. People are definitely helping out. And I think one of the more interesting things is that I'm getting people volunteering, even out of that fairly small group of nearly 80, um, I'm getting an interesting range that really cuts across all of this. 
So another great thing that this has done for me, once I got the word out that I, I wanted people to, uh, to help out, is that they, I, I got contacts from people that didn't think they had a way to contact anyone who was a specialist on or anyway. Maybe they had an interest. And so they started emailing me. And uh, for instance, I've had people, of course, who are PhD students who are interested. That makes sense. They want to, to do this. But I also got um, a note from it's, I think, the deputy head of a school here that, that Leonard Woolley went to when he was young. And he said, we have some information on Woolley. And I want my students to curate their own little exhibit about him. And I said, well, that's great. We've got all this information we'll supply. So we're connected in that way. Uh, I'm getting general interest people, of course, and including a, a writer, I think, in Canada who is Canadian, Iraqi Canadian, who's writing a book about Iraq in that period. And we're supplying information to her. So it's connecting more than just, say, archaeologists. And I think that's a terrific thing. Here's another example of one of the handwritten letters that we have transcribed. And um, very briefly about other engagement things, of course, uh, just as we heard about objects of the month, well, I do that too for Ur. I don't get a lot of hits on there, but I think it's important to do. And in some cases, I can generate more interest. For instance, uh, I know. Neil Gaiman, a rather well-known writer, he came to Philadelphia and I said, would you like to see uh, the storage? And I took him down and showed him the objects. Then I connected it with the ore object, because I'd shown him a lot of those, and I made a blog entry about it. Then Neil saw it and he tweeted it. He says, well, here's a link. He has 1.7 million Twitter followers. <laughs> Even a small percentage of those clicking that link, the Penn Museum website crashed. <laughs> so now it's because we at museums don't expect a lot of volume, you know. And when that volume comes in, they don't know what to do. So, uh, but Neil says that happens a lot with people. He has this even this hashtag. I think it's hash web fail or something where he's caused that to happen. Um, so I don't know that we can always tie into that because my other you know entries don't always get hit like that, and I'm not going to keep bothering him. Oh, can you read this again? Uh, and yet. The way I got the word out about crowdsourcing was almost entirely through Twitter. Uh, it got picked up by other people. They saw it, and then it hit Metafilter, which I think advertised it as do the work that Indiana Jones couldn't be bothered to do. <laughs> which it was fun. And people kind of liked that, and they came in through that. Um, it was put on Ancient World Online, Chuck Jones. And so it is this sort of network that picked up, and we're getting people to know that we exist. And we've got a lot of other information, like these old photos that are just fantastic from different archives. We've got um, the information that was put out in the public press when uh, in the 20s and 30s. This is from the Illustrated London News. And I mean, Orr was huge. It competed with uh, Howard Carter's uh, excavations for kind of the, the position uh, in people's view of uh, archaeology at the time. We have uh, drawings, reconstructions, and things like that. Maybe we can eventually turn that into something like they've done for Giza. But it took them 10 years to do this for Giza, a, a complete 3D reconstruction and uh, fly-throughs and all of that. Down the line, you know, we can think about it, and that can engage people in a different way. But essentially, that's, that's a very quick run-through of what I'm trying to do. And, and of course, if you have any thoughts during the discussions, uh, let me know. Uh, there's my information. And of course, I should mention my colleague at the British Museum, particularly Bertrand Hogestock, who is the uh, curator for the Oregon Forums. So, thank you.